nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Well, hello there, fellow nature nuts. Today we're going to catch up on some unfinished business, things that have, you know, come up as a result of all the other shows we've been doing. The mail is just pouring in to the old nature nook, and I'd like to start by reading you a few of my favorite letters. I try to answer all of them. If I haven't gotten to yours, I will soon. Well, here's one from Sidney Dunkel from the biology department of Collin County Community College. He helped me out with the Dragonfly show. I sent him a tape and he said, I enjoy the program and found it totally factual. Now, that makes me feel good. You don't hear that very often from college professors. Totally factual. He goes on to say, I showed it to one of my college general biology classes and they enjoyed it also and many said they learned from it. Excellent. Okay, well, here's a, here's a letter from Stephen. Stephen is 11 years old. It's a long letter. I won't read you the whole thing. But he does say, oh, here's a good part. I would like to ask you a few questions, but I forget. Stephen, that happens to me all the time. I don't blame you. You have my sympathy. Mine just goes blank. And he goes on for a little bit. Why, well, he remembers his questions a bit later here. His questions are, what are you, what are your two favorite types of ducks? I'd have to say redheads and canvasbacks right now. It changes, you know, different, different times of the year. I like different kinds of ducks. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about there. Oh, and then this, this is a great way to end the letter. He says, I would like to thank you for reading this letter because it means a lot to me because, no doubt about it, I'm a nature nut towards all animals except anteaters and bugs. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I hope you keep watching the show, Stephen, because, you know, we do a lot of shows about bugs, and I hope we can win you over to the bug thing. Uh, speaking of bugs, this is from uh, Mike and Amy, and Mike says, I was at a barbecue last summer, sat on a wooden chair when the bug pinched me on the forearm. I first thought it was a mosquito and knocked it off, but it was very aggressive and got me twice more before I managed to trap it. I have the bug, but it's all dried out, and I have checked all the bug bugs we have, but there is nothing even close to it. Well, Mike sent me a picture of the bug, and based on careful examination of this picture and examination of the dried bug, which he sent to me later, I'm happy to report that it's a lacewing larva, a ferocious but totally harmless creature which lives in your garden and eats aphids, lace wing larva. And here's a very typical letter. You know, our most popular show ever was probably the frog show, and the most popular part of the frog show was the part where I talked about raising fire-bellied toads rather than collecting frogs from your local pond. Fire-bellied toads do well in captivity. Well, here's one from Byron. Byron is seven years old, and he asks me, uh, what do you feed the tadpoles? Well, the tadpoles just eat spinach or lettuce. Make sure to rinse it. The tricky part, Byron, is when they turn into little baby toadlets, and, uh, and you have to find something live to feed them that's very small. I'll show you what I do. I go to the pet store. I buy black worms, live black worms. They look gross, but they're not going to hurt you. And then I put the black worms into a little jar lid, the worm boat, float the worm boat near the toads, the toads hop into the worm boat, and they eat the black worms, and everything works out very well. Oh, yeah, you see, it's just, they love them. It's a bit of a struggle. I mean, you know, pretty big worms for a little toady like that. But that fellow will grow up to be big and strong and very healthy. And some of my uh, some of my friends who I have given firebelly toads to are now having babies from the baby, so they're into their second generation. 
from the toads of the nature nook. Gives you a feeling of great warmth. Firebelly toads have poisonous secretions in their skin too, so you should never put them in your mouth and make sure to wash your hands after you touch them. There are a few people who like frogs as much as I do. One of them is Kim Gray at the Vancouver Aquarium, and I asked her a few questions about the best way to keep your captive frogs. Kim, what advice do you have for the frog keepers of the world? How do you keep your frogs healthy and happy? Well, for a happy, healthy frogs, John, I think you should start with reading. Lots of research, you get to know your little frogs. Um, you can keep them well, better that way. Um, Good diet, really good diet is important. Lots of vitamins, added minerals, good lighting. Um, that helps with the plants if you decide to keep plants in your aquariums. It also helps with them metabolize some of the vitamins and calcium they need. Um, a really good secure lid. Um, you know, we've all experienced little frog dust bunnies running around if they get out. Oh, um, <laughs> also, just a good sized tank. You don't want anything too small. You don't want anything too big either because if, if it's difficult for you to clean and, and maintain it, you might not want to get into it as much so that sort of thing good clean water fresh water um, and the temperature is important as well if you're keeping tropical frogs keeping the temperature that you might find it in the wild at that maintain that temperature also um, if you're keeping a more local species something maybe from southern United States you might also want to get into um, hibernating them just as you do with your bombina the fire belly toads and that sort of thing and get interested in learning about how they mate that's another good way you can learn all sorts of fascinating things and getting them breeding and looking after the tadpoles and proper diet things like crickets and and mm -hmm. mealworms and and uh, some even eat bloodworms and things like that so just find out all you can and then you learn about that if you do decide to get into amphibians or reptiles even, make sure you have a local veterinarian that knows what they're talking about. Just in case something happens, you want to know that you can go to him for advice. Also, even phoning your local aquarium or zoo. They often will I give out advice all the time, and I love doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you've got the nicest gang of frogs I've seen in a long time here, oh, so you good. must be doing things right. All right. Despite their name and their bumpy skin, fire-bellied toads are not toads, they are frogs. Well, here's a nifty tip for all you insect watchers. You remember on our butterfly show, I recommended close-focusing reverse poro prism binoculars for butterfly watching, you know, ones with front lenses that are close together. And I still think that's a great idea. There's a beautiful greenish blue there. Then I discovered this gizmo, which is a close focusing monocular. And they're very popular among European dragonfly watchers. There's a lovely boreal blue it there, but you can still only see through one eye at a time. Now I have the niftiest idea of all. To show you, this is a uh, suggestion that was passed on to me by my friend Carol Perkins. And all it is, is a uh, two element close up lens attached to a lens hood and two elastic bands. And basically, you just slip it on your binoculars like this. This is why you need binoculars with the lenses that are close together. And you get, I mean, I wish you could see this the way I'm seeing it. It's a beautiful, super close-up, three-dimensional image. And believe me, for bug watchers everywhere, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Or, you know, bread, period. Carol Perkins Gizmo, I call it. And boy, does it ever work. As camera designs change, so do the ways that nature photographers find to work around them. Now I have a little bit of unfinished ladybug business to deal with. You remember our ladybug show. Well, one of the species that I didn't get a chance to show you is right here before us, Macronemia episcopalis. When I was 14 years old, I got a letter from a guy named Larry in California. He was nuts about ladybugs, and he desperately wanted to know if I could find him a Macronemia episcopalis because they, you know, they are found here in Alberta where I live and they're not found in California. Well, Larry, there you go, Macronemia episcopalis. Bit late, 20 or so years, but I hope you appreciate it. And then over here, 
This one, this is a 13 spotted ladybug, a beautiful orange thing. When I was an even younger kid, I could crawl around on the lawn any day of the summer and I could find 13 spotted ladybugs. Nowadays, it's a rare sight and this has actually become quite a rare critter. And the reason it's rare is this. In here I have the seven spotted ladybug. We've seen them before. I may not have told you that the seven spotted ladybug is an introduced ladybug from Europe. It was introduced here to help control aphids on the east coast of the United States and it's now spread across the continent, wiping out native species as it goes, or at least making them much more rare than they once were. I don't know whether to, you know, accept it as a cute little ladybug that's kind of nice or whether to be really angry about it. Nothing we could do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. In fact, most people haven't even noticed that the ladybugs of, uh, our country have suddenly and mysteriously changed. Maybe it's a terrible thing. Maybe we should hate it. On the other hand, it's so cute, so red and spotty. <sighs> An ethical dilemma. Just part of being a nature nut, I suppose. Here's another hint for our Nature photography on a budget theme. Get a load of that. Isn't that a beauty? That's a $25 semi-antique uh, camera that my mother picked up for me at a garage sale. And the cool thing about it is it's an SLR. So when you look through it, you're looking through the same lens that takes the picture. What this means is if you want to use your binoculars as a telephoto lens, a very inexpensive alternative to the usual sort of, uh, you know, mega expensive telephoto lens, lining them up, it's just a matter of looking through one and bringing the other. It's kind of like a space docking procedure. There we go. Now I gotta find something to take. Oh, there we go. There's a little baby coot. A cute coot with the orange head. Oh, that's gonna be beautiful. Every frog a wanted frog. That should be the motto of every nature nut. Here's a little bit of forgotten photo technology. Let's say I wanted to take a picture of birds nesting in this bird box, not that there are any, and let's say all I had was my old camera, no telephoto lens, no binoculars. How do you do it? Well, you gotta get the camera close to the bird box, otherwise, you know, it won't be a very good picture, but if you stand with the camera, then the birds won't come anywhere near you. So you have to let the birds get used to the camera and then get yourself a mouse trap. Take the little cheese holder off, save it if you want, hold some cheese with it. Drill a hole where the cheese holder used to be, put some tape around the little whapper, bend this thing, and what you get is this apparatus right down here. Highly modified, highly technical. I'll just arm the unit, you get the picture. Then, get a cable release. Modern cameras don't have these, but old cameras do. Run that through here. Carefully your fingers. And, okay, I'll just tape that to the tripod. Oh, this is such a dandy arrangement. It's so inexpensive. And you just run it up here, put it in the cable release socket of your camera. Make sure everything's in focus. Looks good. And then, what do I do with my fishing line? I need fishing line. Here it is. Attach the fishing line to your little gizmo here. And then move out into a safe hiding place and wait for the bird. <clears throat> okay, let's try a, a test picture here. Perfect. You know, the reason modern cameras don't have uh, cable release is because they use a, an infrared remote control like your television. In many ways, it's an improvement on the technology. You might think about saving up and buying one. Not all members of the ladybug family are called ladybugs. Only the ones with the bright, colorful patterns are. Ba-da-da.
that gives me an idea for a song. You know, these days I get uh, more and more response from songwriters who work in the same genre as myself. Songs about ants, songs about flies. I want to share some of those songs with you, but the first one that I absolutely have to share with you is one that I've known for years. It's called the Might Anthem. It was composed by my friend Heather Proctor. Dr. Proctor is what they call her at Queen's University, where she is a faculty member. She's a mite specialist. And, uh, and this tune, she used to sing it at parties, you know. Every once in a while, she'd spontaneously burst into sort of an operatic version of the Might Anthem. But it's never been given a full musical treatment. And uh, I asked my musical collaborator, Michael Becker, if we could do this for Dr. Proctor, and he felt that not only was it possible, it was our duty. So here you have it, myself and Mr. Becker, Mr. A and Mr. B, as we call each other, performing The Might Anthem by Dr. Proctor. This is a very interesting anthill. Do you remember when we did a show about ants, I was talking about slave-making ants, but I couldn't find any that day. This is the hill of slave-making ants, Polyergus. Now the Polyergus are these ones right here, the red and black ones, and they have very sharp mandibles. That's how you recognize them as Polyergus. They don't have chewing mandibles for doing actual work. They have sharp mandibles. And what they do every summer the polyergus go out on slave raids. They'll leave their hill, they'll go to one of the nearby formica hills, and these are formica here, these little um, uh, solid black ones, 
and any formica who oppose them, they just pierce them in the head with those sharp mandibles. Then they find the place where the formica are keeping their pupae, you know, the unhatched ants, and they'll steal the pupae. They'll steal lots and lots and lots of pupae and bring them back to their own hill, their own nest here. And when the pupae hatch, they don't know what ant they are, though, so they assume that they are polyergus when in fact they are formica, and that's how they become slaves. They do all the work for the polyergus queen. They're the ones who built this hill, they're the ones who gather the food, they're the ones who feed the polyergus. In fact, the polyergus are so useless that even if you give them food, they won't eat it. They have to be fed by one of the other ants, by one of their slaves. Very, very interesting, very bizarre and not an uncommon thing in the world of ants. Just kind of makes you shake your head. Doesn't it? One mite waits in flowers, runs up hummingbird bills, waits in their nostrils, and then runs out at the next flower. Well, you know, before we finish up for today, I think we've got to have a bit of a heart to heart. I want to tell you how hard we try not to fake things on this show. Nature shows they've got a bit of a reputation for faking things, for drugging animals, for buying footage of animals that, you know, they didn't actually see. In general, on this show, if you see it on the screen, I saw it too. We try not to fake things. But I gotta tell you something, the reason I've got a pad of pink photocopy paper in my hands is because my conscience is killing me. You remember the grasshopper show? I was lying in a field, laying back, listening to the sound of crepitating grasshoppers all around me. Well, we didn't get a good recording of crepitating grasshoppers, and so I was sitting in the, in the audio post suite, as they call it, with our audio guy, Johnny Pro Tools, and we discovered that if you run your thumbnail over a pad of paper, it sounds a lot like a crepitating grasshopper. And while we're coming clean, this mailbag, that's the Edmonton Journal. I don't, I don't get that much mail. I still get lots of mail, but not that much mail. I'll read you one more letter. Here's one from Lynn, who says, we like doing nature stuff too, like building birdhouses, butterfly watching, investigating ant hills, watching for signs of moose or deer, and now we also celebrate Big Wet Rodent Day. A lot of people are celebrating it. Celebration of beavers and muskrats, it's July 26th. I know some families who even bake a cake. So, until next Big Wet Rodent Day, I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. Bye for now. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>